Our beliefs are a lot like the wind. We can't see the wind, but we know the wind is blowing by seeing what it does. In the same way, I can't see your beliefs, but I know which way your beliefs are leaning by seeing what you do. Because our, because our behaviors flow from our beliefs. Let's dig into that just a little bit further in that maybe I can't see your beliefs, but I know your beliefs can be seen. What I mean by that is this. We've seen in Peter's writings already in this series that we have an enemy. Peter describes our enemy as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, roaming to and fro seeking someone to devour. Jesus said that our enemy, Satan, is a liar and the father of lies, and when he lies, he speaks his native language. I can't see your beliefs, but I know your beliefs are seen because I know we have an enemy who attacks us because we are image bearers of God. And I know your beliefs are right in his sights, right in his crosshairs. That when you are trying to navigate life, when you're trying to honor God with your life, when you're trying to follow Jesus, you have an enemy who wants to destroy you, an enemy who wants to discourage you, an enemy who wants to deceive you. And he's going to do that by attacking your beliefs. So since we are image bearers of God, we have an enemy who targets people because we are image bearers of God, and our beliefs are at the center of his crosshairs. That's why as we continue on in our series in the letters of Peter, written by a guy who had had some highlight moments and some lowlight moments, he'd had some moments when he stood strong and spoke boldly about Christ, and some moments when he's the one who ran and hid, and he's the one who hid his beliefs. He had good moments, and he had bad moments. And in the midst of all that, as we dive back into his letter, we're going to see Peter confronting three questions. The, the, The three questions are this. What do we believe? Why do we believe it? And how can we guard our beliefs against the attacks of our enemies? I can't see the wind, but I can see what the wind does. I can't see your beliefs, but I can know what you believe by what you do. So as we dive into Peter's letter, continuing to walk through what he wrote to the early church, Those are the three things Peter's going to be answering, and I think it's so important for us to catch that this is a 2,000-year-old letter that is answering current, modern-day, your life and my life questions. Let's dive in. 2 Peter 1, verse 16, where Peter writes this, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. What do we believe? There's a lot we believe. Peter's not getting into every aspect of our theology, of our doctrine, of our beliefs as followers of Jesus, but he's leaning into the question of who Jesus is. We believe that Jesus is God, that Jesus is Savior, that Jesus is Lord. We believe that he is God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That the ever-existing, all-existing, all-knowing, all-powerful Christ took on flesh and dwelt among us. That he is Savior, that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and that he is Lord, that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what we believe about Jesus. And those things come together to add this, that the life and death and resurrection of Jesus is humanity's only hope. We see that all over Scripture. We see that all over the words of Christ, that he's the way, the truth, and the life. Not a way, not a truth, not an option for life. He's the only way. Acts Acts chapter 4 says there's salvation by no one else, for there's no no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. What do we believe about Jesus? He's God, he's Savior, he's Lord, he's our only hope. Now, why do we believe that? We just pulled this out of the air, these cleverly devised myth that, that people just came up with? Like, is this something that, that, that humans just created to try and have some hope in this dark world? Or did it come from something else? Why do we believe what we believe about Jesus? Well, we believe in Jesus, at least in part, because it's based on eyewitness testimony. Eyewitness testimony, first of his followers who were willing to die. Jesus called out a ragtag group of people to be a part of changing the world, to be a part of following him, of being eyewitnesses to his miracles and his mission and his message. 
and he has this group, and they follow him, and they don't get it the whole time. When they see him rise from the dead, they start to believe. When the Holy Spirit comes on them, they work for Christ with great power. But here's what we know about them. That of the 12 disciples, one of them was Judas, and he killed himself after betraying Jesus, and the guy who took his place, his name was, was Matthias, that of the 12 disciples that were following Jesus as the early church began, 11 of them died martyrs' deaths. 11 of them were willing to die for the faith. The one who didn't was John, John the Apostle, writer of the Gospel of John, the Letters of John, the Book of Revelation. What we know about him from church history is he died in exile, imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos, and church tradition tells us that he went there after, being, after surviving being boiled in oil. Why is this important? We stand on the eyewitness testimony of the people who saw Jesus live, die, and rise again. We stand on the eyewitness testimony preserved for us in Scripture. But hear this. People will die for something that's a lie, but they won't die for something that they know is a lie. No one would have ever, like if, like if somebody heated up the oil and dipped my finger in, I'm like, okay, you got me. You got me. I was making it up the whole time. That looks like it's going to hurt. I made up the whole thing. It's a lie. Just cooking bacon on the stove could convince me to do that, right? No one is going to go, no, go ahead and burn me because I can't deny my Christ. No one is going to go to be crucified for something that they know is a lie. We stand on the eyewitness testimonies of those who saw Jesus, who heard Jesus, who knew Jesus, who saw him ascend back to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. But Peter's not only pointing to his eyewitness testimony. I think it's really cool. He's pointing to another one. He's pointing to the the eyewitness testimony of his father, of Christ's father, who declared his love and approval. Peter hints at it, and you may not know the story, But Peter hints at the Mount of Transfiguration where Peter, James, and John, those inner three disciples, they were called up on the mountain to spend time with Jesus. And while they're up there, Jesus is transfigured before them. He is changed, and they're able to see his glory revealed. And while he's up there on the mountain, they're blown away away by what they see. He ends up talking to Moses and Elijah, which is this remarkable scene. And Peter was an eyewitness to that. And while they're there, God the Father speaks from heaven. We don't see that in very many times in Scripture. We, we see it at Jesus' baptism, and we see it here at the transfiguration where God the Father says this, this is my son, in him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. We stand on eyewitness testimony, not cleverly devised myths. Why else do we believe? Look at verse 19. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing the first of all that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Why do we believe what we believe? What do we believe about Jesus? That he's God, he's Lord, he's Savior, he's our only hope. Why do we believe it? Eyewitness testimony of the early church, eyewitness testimony of God himself. And why else do we believe it? It's because we believe that Scripture tells us who Jesus is. And we put faith in the God who gave us his word. We believe in the authority of Scripture. Peter's saying, everything I'm telling you about Jesus is only confirming what God already told us about his plan through his prophets, through the Old Testament. He's pointing back to Scripture. And not only do we believe in the authority of Scripture, Jesus endorsed the authority of Scripture. Jesus said he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. He also said, for truly I say to you that until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until it's all accomplished. He's saying even the punctuation is going to be fulfilled. I didn't love grammar in school. But Jesus is saying even the grammar was important. Even that will be fulfilled. Not only did Jesus endorse the authority of the Bible, God preserved Scripture for us so that we have access to this, that it's been passed down to us and is reliable in how it's passed down. We'll spend more time on this in a few weeks in the new year when we start a series walking through the Bible. More on that later. But I do want to touch on this here. Why do we have confidence that God preserved the Bible? Well, if you look at the New Testament, we have 5,000 original manuscripts. Pieces of the New Testament that are written in the, in, in the original language close to the time that it was written, 5,000 of them. We have 10,000 manuscripts if you go to ancient translations. 
Syriac and Arabic and Latin. You get to one million quotes of the New Testament if you go to early church fathers. If you take all of those pieces and all of those parts and you bring them all back together and compare them to one another, okay, I have a manuscript of 2 Peter over here and I have a manuscript of 2 Peter over here and I bring them together. All the different books of the New Testament, you bring them all together, there is agreement between those thousands of documents 99.5% of the time. If I started a sentence on this side of the room and you passed it to one another, one sentence, it wouldn't make it back on on that side of the room. It wouldn't happen. Only God could preserve his word the way he has. 99.5%. You okay, Kel? What about that other 0.5%? Here's what you got to hear. That's 400 words in 40 verses. And not one of those verses is key to understanding essential doctrine. That's how reliable God's word is. That's why we can go, yes, I know who Jesus is, and I know what Jesus did, and I know what Jesus wants from me. Why? Because I trust in the authority of God's word, and I trust that God preserved his word to hand it to us. Not only that, if you take all of those different parts of Scripture, from Old Testament to New Testament, I want you to hear there is internal coherence of Scripture. The Bible's 66 books written by 40 authors over a 1,500-year period on three continents in three languages. The entire book, though, in spite of all of that, which is truly remarkable, right? Hollywood can't put out a trilogy with different directors and have a unified story, right? Star Wars, man, they just wrecked it, didn't they? Nerds unite here, right? 66 books, 40 authors, 1,500 years, three continents, three languages. The entire book is one united story. We've seen this picture before, but it bears repeating. You know what this image on the screen is? 66,779 cross-references in Scripture, meaning this part of Scripture is confirming that part of Scripture. And that part of Scripture is reaching back and confirming and uniting to and tying to that one. God's Word is a miracle. God, forgive us for collecting dust on our shelf. We believe in the authority of Scripture. Here's, here's, here's the next thing. We believe in the inspiration of Scripture. We are not studying this because Peter's a smart guy. Honestly, if we study Peter's life, Peter's way more like us than we'd probably want to admit, right? We're not studying this because Peter's a smart guy. We're studying it because we believe that Scripture is breathed out by God. Peter said, verse 21, men spoke from God and as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Paul put it this way, 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is breathed out by God. Meaning what we hold in our hands is not the wisdom of men. It is the very word of God. But that's why as a church, we go book by book and verse by verse through scripture. Because we don't have any wisdom to bring to the table. This is not about what Cal or any of the elders think. It's about what God has to say to your life and mine. So we believe in the inspiration of Scripture, and we also believe in the purpose of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3 goes on to say, all Scriptures read that by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. What does it mean to be equipped and prepared for every good work? What's our good works that we're supposed to do? Well, what's the purpose of man? Our creeds and catechisms take all that God has written through Scripture and boil it down to here's these these, uh, digestible nuggets of truth that we can cling to. What's the purpose of man, the chief end of man, to glorify God and enjoy him forever? For us too, as it says on our wall, enjoy his grace and extend his glory. That's our purpose in life. And we believe the Bible is where we find out how to enjoy God's grace and extend his glory. I don't get to come up with what it looks like to do that or how to do that. You wouldn't want to listen to me anyways. God's words gives us what we need. Remember, we have everything we need for godliness provided for us by God. It's, all of, it's in all of Scripture we learn who God is, who we are, what God desires, and how we fulfill that calling in our life. So because we believe that the Bible is God's word, hear this. Everything and everyone must be tested against the teaching of God's word. That includes me. That's why I asked you guys the other day to be Bereans. Be like the church in Berea, that they went and they heard what what Paul had to say, and then they went back to the scriptures to confirm it. Good life. Be Bereans. Go back and check on me or anybody else who steps to the stage. Why? Because the authority is not me, and the authority is not the elders. The authority is God and his word. Although other things can be helpful. 
Preaching can be helpful. Bible studies can be helpful. Books on theology can be helpful. We have a library out there. Rather, because they are helpful, they are not an, another authority. They all bow to the authority of God's Word and must be tested against that. So, we must know God's Word because we have an enemy who has our beliefs in his crosshairs. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there were, will be false teachers among you, who will, secretly, who, who, will bring, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. You walk through the Old Testament, and you walk through the history of God's people, and you'll see multiple times where false prophets arose among them. Prophets who claimed to speak for God, but they were really mouthpieces for the enemy. And just as Israel had false prophets, the church is targeted by false teachers. False teachers are not a 2,000-year-old issue. False teachers are a dangerous and ongoing threat to our beliefs, to yours and mine today. False teachers are, Peter sort of outlined some characteristics of what false teachers might be like. What are some behavioral patterns you might see in them? We'll talk more about that at the end, but let's see what Peter has to say here. The first is this, that they are sensual and self-indulgent, that they seek to care for themselves more than the glory of God or for the people of God. John MacArthur says it this way, that Satan continues his efforts to make sin less offensive, heaven less appealing, hell less horrific, and the gospel less urgent. Nothing gets in the way of those things being taught correctly more than sensuality, the pursuit of pleasure, and self-indulgence, the, the embracing of our will rather than the denying of our will. Because their hearts are greedy, these people will pursue money and power and pleasure and peddle them to the church as gifts from God. God would want you to have this. God would want you to experience that. God would want you to be happy. God doesn't really, his, his primary goal is not our happiness. Because you know what? We have no idea what would make us happy. God's concerned with our holiness. And in only in holiness and in Christ-likeness and relation with him will we ever find any measure of happiness in life. Not only are they sensual and self-indulgent, they're truth-denying. They deceive people, and they deny even the existence of truth. I put to you that today's culture views biblical truth as hate speech. And I can't think of anything more hateful than denying what God's Word says and telling everybody it'll be okay one day. I would rather offend you today to be responsible for your lost soul in eternity. There's nothing more hateful than pointing people away from God's truth. That is the opposite of love. We must make sure, though, that as we cling to God's truth, as we cling to God's word, as we live as lights in a dark world, here's what we need to hear. We don't always pull this off well. We have to cling to uncompromising truth, but it needs to be wrapped in unconditional love. Jesus came full of grace and truth. It was not one or the other, it was both and. And we need to live the same way, full of grace and truth. Uncompromising truth. God has said it. We believe it. We will cling to it. It is hateful for me to try and tell you that it's not true. But also doing it in a way that is incredibly loving. Sometimes in the name of love, we compromise truth. Sometimes in the name of truth, we compromise love. We don't have that option. Scripture calls us to live in the tension of both. These false teachers, though, are truth-denying, sometimes under the guise of love. But that's not loving. The third one is this. They're Christ-denying. False teachers use the name of Christ to lead people away from Christ. I'm not even sure they know that they're doing it. Maybe sometimes they do. But eventually, when somebody is trying to deny truth, when somebody's focused on sensuality and self-indulgence, when it's all about power, possessions, pleasure... For, for, for the teacher and also for the student, eventually they're going to lead people to say this, that Jesus is a way, not Jesus is the way. Eventually, when you start to go, does God's word really say that? Or does that really apply to our time? Or is that really true? Or that's really in question? Or maybe we're misinterpreting it. We're trying to explain away scripture. Eventually, you're going to land on the point of, 
eh, is Jesus the only way? They always land there. It's the exact same place they always land because it is offensive to say there's only one way. You know what it means if there's one way? Every other way is wrong. And that offends people, but there's nothing more hateful than having them pretend that there's another option. I put to you the worst evils are sometimes committed by those who are convinced they are achieving the most good. I don't think people are doing this because they're convinced that what they're doing is evil and therefore they want to do evil. No, they convince themselves that evil is good. And they're going to try and do it in the name of something good, to deny truth because it's offensive, to avoid difficult beliefs because it turns people off. I'll tell you, there are Sundays when we have like our plan of what we're going to preach. I'm, like, I've pretty much planned what we're preaching all the way through June and maybe even through August, so I, so I kind of know. And so then on what, whatever week when I sit down to try and finalize a message, sometimes I sit there and go, oh, I don't know if I want to preach this, right? That's one of the things about book by book and verse by verse is I don't get to go, yeah, that, that one's a little touchy, let's just skip it. No, it's like, it's there, here we go, we got to preach it. Praise God, he sometimes brings it together, and I hope it's no more offensive than Scripture means to be. That's my goal. I got to tell you, there's some things in, in, in my selfish heart, I'd go, boy, I'd rather not have to think about this one this week, and I'd rather not be the one who says it this week. But that's not loving, and that's not the call there. Here's what I want us to hear. Biblical Christianity is unpopular, but popular Christianity might be unbiblical. You know that's from a meme with Jim Halpert. I saw it. I have no idea to credit this. This is not my line. I put it in quotes. I'm not sure to do it. But you know what? Sometimes memes are funny because they're true, Right? Biblical Christianity is going to be unpopular. Jesus didn't say it was a wide road, that, wide road that leads to life. He said it was a narrow road that leads to life. I put to you right now that there are more false teachers who have more reach and more influence than any time in church history. There's more errors. They have more followers. They have a greater impact. It used to be a time in history, and, and I grew up during this time, where in order to, un to, to know that you were hearing the truth, you had your pastor, you had some books that you read, right? And you had your parents, and those were the voices in your life. You may have had some talk at school, but you, for the most part, that's where you heard about God. We didn't have access to every possible voice. So if your pastor was rightly dividing the word, you were getting good truth, right? Now, you could, before you get home, listen to 10 different pastors. You may have earphones in right now. What do I know, right? <laughs> there are so many voices that are so accessible. I've gotten to the point now where I can't tell you who not to listen to. And I don't say that arrogantly because I want you to check on me too. I can't tell you who not to listen to because there's too many of them. What I can tell you is here's the voices that I trust. You know why we have a library to a certain extent? So we can put before you, here are the voices that we trust. There are thousands of books that maybe you could read and find some good stuff in there, but I'm not sure I trust the voice. And you know what you'll find if you go through our library? A lot of the people who wrote in there, they're dead. So that's the safest ones to deal with. You already know everything about them. That was probably a little too honest. There are more false teachers with more reach and more influence in any time in church history. Peter wrote this to a people who had no access to the internet or, or, or television or social media. Tell me we don't need this even more than Peter's original audience. We must be on guard because God takes unbelief very, very seriously. Look at verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness, be kept until the judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. What does Peter do here? He pauses in the midst of this talk of believing rightly to remind us from God's story, from from. From, from the redemptive plan that God has preserved in his word, he, he reminds us, like, this is how God handles unbelief. And God takes it very seriously. It's packed with examples of the high price of unbelief. Fallen angels who rebelled against God, sided with Satan, kicked out of heaven and destined for hell. The flood where humans grew so wicked, God regretted even making them. 
So he sent a flood to wipe them out, preserving only one family. Sodom and Gomorrah, a city renowned for its affluence, but more known for its immorality. God sent angels to rescue Lot and his family because Abraham begged God to do so. And then that city got destroyed with fire and brimstone. You know, archaeologists, they believe they found where Sodom and Gomorrah is, and they find evidence of fire and sulfur. You know what brimstone is? It's sulfur. God takes unbelief very seriously. So should we. These accounts of God's wrath, they provide caution to us that we should take them seriously. But the accounts also should provide comfort. Look at verse 7. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed, I'm sorry, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day by day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. God provided a rescue for Abraham's family, Lot and his wife and his daughters from Sodom and Gomorrah. Peter uses the word righteous to describe Lot. If you know the story, it's a debatable term. I think, I think what, what Peter is saying is that Lot knew the truth and was defiled by being among a people who didn't accept the truth and that it wore down his faith. We must be very careful of swimming in the currents of culture and expecting us not to get wet with it. God knows how to protect the righteous. He knows how to punish the unrighteous. And while this world is full of lies and while the church will be attacked by our enemies and his false teachers, we can know that God has been faithful in the past and he will be faithful today. Now in this last section, as we dive into it, it's, it's one of the longest sections we'll read at any point here at Good Life. We usually break it down a little bit more. But as I was studying, it's like, Peter's on a roll. I don't want to interrupt Peter as he's sort of sharing this with you. And all of it's really kind of making the same point. So I'm going to let Peter just sort of let loose. I, I would imagine Peter had a bit of a temper just reading through Scripture. And I think Peter's a little hot at this point. I think it, you know, at the end of this, he probably wiped his brow. You know, he's, he's writing it out, right? Let's let him hear what he has to say as he lets us understand how God views false teachers. Verse 10, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious one. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Baor, who loved gaining, sorry, loved gain from wrongdoing. He was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. That's a true story. We won't go into it, but it's worth reading. Uh, verse 17, these are waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boast of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For it, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to the wallow in the mire. Peter didn't hold back, and neither should we in having an understanding of how important right teaching is, of clinging to truth in a world full of lies is. Peter calls these false teachers. He calls them waterless springs and storm-driven mist. Now, we live in a, in a climate where water is not an issue for us at this point. Like, there's enough 
humidity in the air to not deal with that. But our, our climate and our geography is very different from this, from this part of the world that Peter was writing. Many of them were living in arid regions where water was scarce and hard to come by. And when you talk about a waterless spring and a storm-driven mist, they hint at the promise of water but never deliver water. They hint at the promise of water but leave you thirsty and dry. False teachers hint at the truth. They wrap deception in a veneer of truth. but They never deliver truth. Because God's perfect truth denies man's sinful passion. It comes against what we want. It causes us to go, I must deny myself and follow Jesus. Why? Because God's truth confronts my flesh and doesn't allow me to do what I want to do. Self-indulgence as a call from God? No, self-denial is the call from God. False teachers lead people to desire money and pleasure and possessions and power, telling them this is God's desire for their life. They entice them to indulge in their old desires with just a thin veneer of Jesus. And they're not proclaiming the truth nor calling people to follow the truth. It would be interesting to walk through and begin to give you names of people to watch out for. But as I told you, the list is long and getting longer of people that I can't point to. And I please, I, I don't want you to hear that as arrogance on my part. Not that I'm immune to that possibility, but I want you to hear my heart breaks at that reality. That was not, the, that was not true growing up for me. Growing up for me over the last 50 years, that for me to come up with it, like, uh, like 10 names of people that I'd say, you probably shouldn't listen to them, would have been very difficult. Our culture in the last 50 years has proliferated that to a huge extent. So I can't go through and just give you names. And if I gave you names, I'd miss people. What I'd rather give you is with the help of an article by, my, by a guy named Tim Challies or Callies, I'm not ex sure exactly how to pronounce it, is put before you seven warning posters of what to watch out for. Here's uh, the type of false teachers to watch out for, and we'll walk through those. The article's called Seven False Teachers that are in the church today. And it's not about names, though he addresses them in the article. Um, and I think it's worth you probably checking out the article. I think it's well worth reading. But I do want to walk through the title. We actually touched on this um, about 18 months ago when we were in 2 John in the series called Marked. Um, but I think it's worth going through here a little bit different than we did that time because I think it ties into what we do and gives you, here's the warning signs to watch out for. Here's the first type of false teacher, the heretic. The heretic is the person who teaches what blatantly contradicts an essential teaching of the Christian faith. He's typically gregarious, a natural leader, teaching just enough truth to mask deadly error. I'd say this is one of the most prolific ones right now. Just enough truth to mask deadly error. The second one is the charlatan. The charlatan is only interested in the Christian faith to fill his own pockets. Have you guys ever seen preachers and sneakers? You know what I'm talking about? It's on social media, one of the very few redeeming things of social media. Uh, social media is, is an, it, I see it on Instagram, it's probably other places, but it's like, here's this pastor preaching, and it gives you the breakdown of their outfit. Now, mine, nobody's coming to me for fashion advice, and none of it's very nice, but you have these things, the, the preachers and their, and their sneakers, like $600, $700 sneakers on this preacher. What's the message there? 70 bucks, Amazon. First shoes I bought in a year, right? And my wife really loves them, so I'm wearing them today, right? Here, here we go. I say that to say the charlatan is the one who is very concerned with what he owns, with how he looks, with what he flies, with what he drives. And that's, that's a problem. You don't see that modeled in the New Testament. And you certainly don't see it modeled in the life of Christ. He uses his leadership position to benefit from the wealth of others. Here's the third one. The prophet, the prophet claims to be gifted by God to speak fresh revelation outside of Scripture, new authoritative words of prediction, teaching, rebuke, or encouragement. You know who does that? Joseph Smith. <sighs> new words from God, if they don't align with the word of God, are lies. New words from God that align with the words of God aren't necessary because we already have the word of God. You're not going to hear me say, I have a word from the Lord for you, 
What I say is that God's word has a word for you. The prophet wants to say, I've got something new to share. That new thing, undoubtedly, if it, con- if, if it contradicts Scripture, it's a lie. If it doesn't, it's not new. Fourth one, the abuser. Sadly, this is a reality in the modern church. The abuser uses his position of leadership to take advantage of other people, to feed his sexual lust, though he may also desire power. The abuser claims to be tending souls, but his true interest is ravishing bodies. He unapologetically uses and abuses others to feed his own lust. The church has had a problem with this lately. And it's absolutely heartbreaking to see. Whether it's abuse or falling into sexual sin, this is an area of attack against elders. I asked you guys a few weeks ago, pray for myself and the other elders. Why? Because the enemy would love to tear us down. Where is an area where he may attack is in this. We need to pray for the, the victims of these things and for the protection of all of us from these things. But this goes from falling into lust to sliding into abuse. This is an entirely different thing. Awful nonetheless. Beware of the abuser. Beware of the church that enables the abuser. Beware of the church that um, ignores the abuser's sin. Someone to have done that and be back in the pulpit at some time in the future, not a biblical stance. Fifth, the divider. The divider uses false doctrine to disrupt or destroy a church. False doctor, sorry, a false teacher brings strife, not love. He generates factions, not unity. He, dis, he desires discord, not harmony. This is one that goes in and either uses lies or wrongly applying truth to bring division between, between people. You know somebody who's not happy unless there's drama? This is what it looks like when that person's a pastor. Here's number six, the speculator. The speculator is one who is obsessed with novelty, originality, or speculation. He grows weary of the old truths and pursues respectability through originality. I pray, whatever I say to you on a Sunday morning, that the the body of Christ has heard those same things on Sunday mornings for the last 2,000 years. My goal is not novelty. My goal is not to go, I've never heard that before. If I'm saying something you've never heard before, and nobody ever heard before, I'm probably saying something that's not right. It needs to be standing up. Like we stand on the shoulders of the ones who came before us, on the truth of God's word, and and the faith handed once for all over to the church. A speculator is not necessary. Their teaching is focused on speculation, and it displaces the sure and steady doctrine of Scripture. He tosses aside the bulk of the Bible's content and emphasis to obsess about matters that are trivial or new. Beware of the speculator. And here's the last one. I don't love the name, but I'm rolling with it because it's biblical. The tickler. I know. The tickler craves popularity and praise from the world. He speaks much of happiness, but little of sin. Much of heaven, but nothing of hell. He gives them only what they want to hear. He preaches an empty gospel to a packed out church. What does this come from? 2 Timothy chapter 4 Paul writes, there will come a time when men will not endure sound teaching, but will bring, will surround themselves with teachers who tickle their itching ears. My prayer every single Sunday is I've been obedient to God's word, that the elders, when they preach in my place, are obedient to God's word. And I know if we are obedient to God's word, we all go, man, I wish I'd worn my steel-toed boots today. Because if we are obedient to God's word, it will step on our toes over and over and over again. I want there to be hope on the other side of that and encouragement on the other side of that, that that there is joy in following Jesus. But if we aren't coming to grips with the ways we don't look like Christ, what are we doing here? If all we want to have is our ears tickled with the things we want to hear, then we don't really want to hear God's word. Callies goes on to say this, Satan's greatest ambassadors are not pimps, politicians, or power brokers, but pastors. His priests do not peddle a different religion, but a deadly perversion of the truth. May God protect us and protect you and your heart and your mind from the deceptions of false teaching. It is slick. It is well-produced. It is well-communicated. 
It is accessible. It is written in a way that, that taps into felt needs, that taps into eternal desires, that taps into, that's what I really want to hear, right? God, protect us from false teaching and let us desire your word even and especially when it steps on our toes. How can we guard our beliefs against the attacks of the enemy? Hear this. To spot the lies, you must first know the truth. Do you know the truth? Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Have you surrendered your life to him as Lord and Savior? Apart from that, you are exposed. You are out on your own, and you, are, you will one day stand on your own before a holy God and answer for your life. But if you're in Christ, you'll stand before God covered in his righteousness. And when God says, why should I accept you? The answer is not anything you've done or anything you're doing or anything you will do. The answer is what Christ accomplished on the cross and that you've trusted in him. Do you know Jesus? Is the content that you absorb in your life, the things you read, the things you watch, the things you consume on social media, are they helping you to know Jesus more? Take a second today and check out your screen time on your phone. Dig into your settings, dig around and find it, search for that setting, go in and see what your screen time is. And how much of that time helps you know Jesus more? Walk back through your watch list on your, on, on your streaming apps, right? Which ones you've completed and checked off? Did it help you know Jesus more? Are the people you're listening to and the people that you're reading, are they helping you know Jesus more? Can you spot a false teacher? And are the people you're listening to helping you love Jesus more? helping you love others more like Jesus? Are you living out uncompromising truth and unconditional love? So that maybe, so, maybe someone else can come to know Jesus through you. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word, for tough passages that make us come to grips with the lies around us. Lord, help us guard our hearts. Give us discerning ears. Help us to have a hunger for your word so that we can not only know Jesus the truth, but we can know the truth of your word so we can discern lies. Lord, if we don't know what's authentic, we won't be able to discern what is counterfeit. And the enemy doesn't come at us with animal sacrifices and spells and Ouija boards. Lord, he comes at us as an angel of light telling us that bad things are good things, that evil things are good things, and enticing us to say we're missing out or God is holding out on us. Lord, let us trust your heart. Let us trust your word. Let us trust our lives to who you've called us to be. Our purpose is to enjoy your grace in relationship with Jesus Christ and to extend your glory, bringing the light of your truth and the good news of the gospel across the street and around the world. We live in a world that is captive to the domain of darkness. And you have entrusted us with the light of the good news of the gospel. Lord, let us long for nothing less than your word and your truth. Let our lives reflect nothing less than your word and your truth. Lord, let our hearts reflect nothing less than the heart of Jesus to a world that desperately needs it. It's in his name that we pray, amen.